Hi, good afternoon. First of all, thank you so much for taking your time to join us today for Asunta Facebook Live. My name is Jajun and I'm a dietitian working in Asunta Hospital. Today we are presenting Gout, a Disease of Kings by Dr. Shamala. First of all, if you have any question during the live talk, please type them into the comment box below in below this video. And your question will be answered during the Q&A session at the end of this live talk. Now, without further ado, let us welcome the speaker today, Dr. Shamala. She's our consultant physician and rheumatologist. She graduated from University of Liverpool, United Kingdom in 2001. And since then, she practiced her housemanship and even completed her specialization. Her areas of expertise include rheumatology, dealing with inflammatory disorders of joints, tendons, muscles, and ligament, arthritis-related disorder, etc. Good afternoon, Dr. Shamala. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you, Jajun, for the very kind introduction. I'm Shamna Rajalingam, rheumatologist and physician from Asunta Hospital. A very warm welcome and thank you for joining us today on this Facebook Live session on the topic of gout, a disease of kings. Now, before we start, let me just explain to you what is a rheumatologist and what is it that I do. So basically, a rheumatologist is a doctor who specializes in diseases of the bone, joints and muscles. A commonly heard of issue will be arthritis, such as osteoarthritis. Other than this, a rheumatologist also treats diseases related to the dysfunction of your immune system. And this is known as autoimmune diseases or rheumatic diseases. Today, I chose to talk on gout, which is also well known as the disease of kings. It used to be known as a disease of kings, not anymore. Now, gout is a type of arthritis that happens when you have too much uric acid in your body and this precipitates into crystals and it can uh, affect one or more of your joints. Arthritis as a whole leaves patients with a lot of pain and eventually disability. You are unable to continue with your daily activities due to the pain. So let's start. My first slide will be on the type of arthritis. So let me just break it into three broad terms, which is degenerative, inflammatory or crystal related is what we're going to talk about today. So the common degenerative arthritis you probably have heard of is osteoarthritis, which is in simple terms, wear and tear of your joint. The commonly known Inflammatory arthritis is something called uh, rheumatoid arthritis, is what I specialize in. And this is related to a dysfunction in your immune system. So the uncommon arthritis that you probably didn't realize it is a joint issue is gout. Now, what I want to emphasize here is that if you have high uric acid level, it does not mean you will have gout. High uric acid level happens generally in uh, according to what your dietary intake will be. But gout is a syndrome which happens due to this high uric acid level. So gout is an ancient disease. It is a very, uh, it's, sorry, it's the oldest known arthritis. It was first presented by Hippocrates in the 5th century who recognized gout as an affection of older men, and it's a product of high living back in the fifth century. However, this painful condition has accompanied us to the 21st century. I just want to show you this well-known gout painting, uh, aptly named just the gout by James Gilray in 1799. Now, James Gilray was an artist from London, and he depicts very well how uh, arthritic patient feels. If you can see this uh, painting, there is a hideously swollen foot resting up on a nice, comfortable pillow. But you can see the first toe is very swollen. And this is where the complaint generally starts with. The patient complains of a hot, throbbing pain. Now, in this painting, you can also see what we call the gout demon. 
who is viciously digging in his fangs and breathing fire onto the joint. This just goes to show to you how painful and piercing a gout attack can be. I just want to talk to you a little bit on the epidemiology of, or the prevalence of gout in the Asia Pacific region. We live in Malaysia, a very multicultural country. The three different races have got uh, different uh, eating habits and that actually represents how our uric acid levels also uh, uh, show up. So generally, high uric acid levels are seen commonly in the Malays and the Indians. However, that does not translate to how common the arthritis is in these uh, races. Commonly, arthritis, uh, gout arthritis tends to affect the Malays and Chinese a bit more, probably related to the higher meat content. But that is not always true because the Indians tend to eat a bit more uh, lentils or what we know as kachap. In the Asia Pacific region, also Taiwanese is one of the Taiwanese are one of the countries which highest prevalence of gout. Could it be related to the seafood content? I'm not sure. Okay, so the interaction of your gout crystals with your joint is what precipitates in your joint to cause painful swelling. Now let's go back to what is the meaning of the word gout. Now it came from a Latin word gutta which is a drop of liquid. Now, there's an ancient belief that says it was the devil that was causing the disease by instilling poisonous humor into the joint of the victim, drop by drop. So today, however, we know this is not true. Gout is related to an elevated uric acid level and the deposition of that uric acid level in the joint and this tends to happen when it's above a particular threshold of 7 milligrams per deciliter. And that's what causes the gout attack. Now, once the, the deposition of the crystal itself may not be painful. However, your body mounts an inflammatory reaction. And that releases particular uh, interleukins, better known as interleukin-1. And that's what causes this very painful hot and red joint. I just want to show you how the crystals, if you look at the nice, colorful, beautiful picture, and that is what we would see under a microscope. Long needle-shaped crystals, which are actually poking onto your joint, causing you the pain. These are common pictures I just want to show you. Like I, I said earlier, it tends to affect your first toe. This is uh, commonly called podagra. And you can see in my picture on the right, there is uh, two swollen fingers. Um, it's very hot and red. And that can happen also over your elbows. Now, if you notice, I've named it a tophi. Now, what tophi generally means, this is um, swelling of the area, which is not at your joint. It's actually over your tendons. These are actually painless. However, when a tophi gets infected, it can turn red and very hot. And depending on where the tophis are, such as over your thighs or even the soles of your feet, it can be quite painful. You can see there's a picture on your right-hand corner, and that is a tophi over the pinna of your ear. It can be painless, but if it gets very infected, it is painful. So how do we diagnose gout in the first place? The first thing you would have is a painful joint, remember? So you would go to see your doctor. If your first attack, the doctor might just give you an anti-inflammatory medicine and say, go away and it'll get better. However, if it keeps happening, and if it keeps happening over big joints, the first thing a doctor will want to rule out is something called septic arthritis, <clears throat> which means there's an infection at your joint. So the best way to rule this out is to actually put a needle in Take out a bit of fluid. If it is septic arthritis, it will show a high amount of organisms or bacteria. However, a gout joint will give you a white liquid, and you can see it in the test tube over on my right-hand side. And once this fluid is obtained, it will be analyzed under a specialized light microscopy. And this is what we would see, needle-shaped crystals 
which is negatively bifringent in a particular uh, microscope called compensated polarized light. As you can see, it's very beautiful. However, that does not depict how the patient feels when it's very painful. Okay, so there's a few things that you would need to do uh, to exclude other issues. So the doctors would ask you to do certain baseline investigations, such as a blood test, including your blood count, kidney levels, and of course, your uric acid level. I want to emphasize again, a high uric acid level does not mean you have gout. So it's not routine to actually check your uric acid level. If you see a rheumatologist, we will usually explain to you, you will only check your uric acid level if we have a clinical suspicion that it is gout. Blood glucose, fasting sugar, uh, fasting lipids, and a urinalysis is often carried out because in gout patients, more than 50% in studies have shown to also have other issues such as cholesterol issues, diabetes, and high blood pressure. So when I treat a patient with gout, you don't just treat the gout attack. You need to treat the patient as a whole to rule out other issues accompanying the gout. Other investigations that I would do include x-rays. So if you come in with a hot and swollen joint, as you know, x-rays, we're looking at the bones. I will only see soft tissue swelling to help me make a diagnosis. This is in the early stage, but in the chronic late stage, what I'm looking for is any erosions in the bone to suggest that the gout has been going on for a long time. Another thing that I would do uh, routinely on the big side is something called an ultrasound. This is a new modality which is available to help diagnose a patient with gout. I am sure not everybody likes having a needle stuck into their joint. So an ultrasound is done by the bedside and a few things that we're looking out for. Remember the profile. So other subtle changes that we could see is something called double contour signs, snowstorm appearance. So this is seen over one, your first uh, big toe. It can also be seen at your knee. And this is very highly sensitive and it's non-invasive. And it is very specific in early disease. So you can actually pick up a patient with gout without having the profile uh, in early disease. So other modalities which is available include MRI or CT scans, not routinely done unless your gout or profile seems to happen in other areas such as your spine. So what are the principles of treatment? When we treat a patient with gout, the first thing that we need to tell the patient is, and of course what they're looking for is a quick resolution of the pain. But you must also tell them that it can come back. So the whole idea of treating a patient is to avoid further attacks and prevent the complications that can come with gout, such as kidney stones and depositions of profile anywhere in the body. So most important, I would always emphasize, is the need for a lifestyle modification and plus minus a need for medication. People with gout should also be told how to manage their attacks and how, very importantly, with the diet to keep the uric acid levels low to prevent further attacks. So before we start about medications, I mean, when you come and see a doctor, you always think they're going to give me 10 medications that I need to take for life. No, if this is your first attack of gout, you will not need long-term medications. You will need maybe a painkiller to help reduce that acute pain, but you will need a lot of non-pharmacological pharmacological management. And this includes advice on weight reduction, importance of exercise, and with exercise comes adequate hydration. I always advise any of my gout patients, very important to drink three to four liters of fluid a day. Good if you can avoid alcohol, sugary drinks, and even the fizzy drinks have got a high amount of uh, uric acid, and not to eat too much of meat or seafood. I always tell my patients, I can't tell you not to eat it at all, but I can tell you how to avoid and reduce your intake. It is very important that we also try and see what are the other medications that could be precipitating these gout attacks, such as the concomitant use of diuretic therapies or certain high blood pressure medicine. And uh, some 
uh, anti-tuberculosis treatment medication could also cause this. So sometimes we cannot stop those medications, but we can give you ways to prevent um, the, the high uric acid level that comes with these medications. Finally, like I told you earlier, when you see a patient with gout, most important, you talk to them about the risk of any issues or cardiovascular diseases in the future. So what are the medications around? There's quite a few, but let's start with the acute attack. So if you come in with a hot and swollen joint and you can't walk on it, the first thing you want is a quick relief. So the first thing we would give you is something called a non-steroidal, which is non, um, it's not steroid based basically. It helps reduce the swelling fast. Other common medication and quite importantly given in a gout patient is something called autism. And of course, we have got steroids. Steroids can be used either as a tablet form or it can be injected into your joint for a quick uh, relief. So that is in the acute stage. If you come in with the first joint, this is what we will give you. If you keep coming in more than two to three times in a year, you need something called urate lowering therapy. There are few in the market. The common one is called allopurinol. It is cheap, easily available, but you do need a prescription to buy this for the simple reason it can be potentially fatal, such as causing certain skin disorders called Steven Johnson syndrome. So you need to speak to your doctor before you start on this therapy. These medications are taken at a low dose and tapered up according to your uric acid level. So who are the patients who get issues with these drugs? So commonly it's ladies, uh, people with underlying kidney issues using diuretic therapy and certain Chinese or Pan's origin. And it's also important, like I told you earlier, the medication uh, allopurinol is started at a low dose and titrated up slowly. So this is done uh, to, uh, within three to four weekly intervals. There is a newer, maybe not so well-known medication called Febrizostat, which can be used as an alternative or as, uh, uh, as an alternative or for patients who have got very severe Kofi deposition, and it's called Febrizostat. It's slightly more expensive, but it's a widely available currently. Other not so commonly used medications, which also tends to help reduce uric acid level by by increasing its excretion in the urine, include benzvimerone, probinazid, and euglotecase. Now, I've put on a few uh, lists there for medications which help reduce your uric acid level to a small extent, but not as a treatment for gout. And this include vitamin C, high doses, phenofibrates, and uh, ARB, which is a hypertensive medication called Rosatin, and ural. It's given, this is a particular medicine to, given to alkalinize your urine for patients who have gout stones in the kidneys. So what are we looking for when we give you these medications? Remember I told you a common medication is allopurinol. We started at low dose and we would increase it slowly. The aim of treatment here is to reduce your uric acid level. But the target is below 360 millimole if you do not have any profile. But if you have TOFI anywhere in your body, this target is further reduced to 300. So why and who came up with these targets? These were targets set up by the rheumatology community worldwide because in studies it's been shown, it reduces the frequency of the gout attacks, reduces the TOFI size, and helps deplete crystal spores in your fluid, in synovial fluid, and hence prevent those painful crystal deposition. It helps improve renal function as a whole because you'll be using less painkillers. And of course, it slows progression of any existing renal disease, especially if it's due to, uh, commonly due to kidney stones. So I've got a whole long list of uh, purine uh, dietary intakes here. So it goes according to uh, low purine uh, content, to moderate, to high purine content. So generally, you can see the high purine content food include anything such as mackerel, sardines, seafood generally, nuts, peanuts, cashew nuts, and um, meat, red meat particularly. So if you look at this list, it's very exhausting and you think you need to avoid a lot of it. 
But trust me, once you're controlled and your targets are reached, you can start introducing these foods groups slowly and watch for your attacks. So I want to actually end by saying, gout is the only arthritis which is treatable and controllable with diet and medication, and that cannot be emphasized further. Please do come and see a rheumatologist so that you can get further advice. I'll just I'll pass you now back to Jajun. Thank you so much, Dr. Shamala, for this very informative talk. Now let us look at some of the comments and some of the questions that uh, previously we have looked into the Google form. Okay. So the first question that we have uh, submitted in the Google form is. Uh, how do you know if it's gout and when to get it really checked out? Okay, like I told you earlier, classically, pain starts at your first toe, but that is not always the case. <clears throat> I've seen patients who have their first gout attack over their knee. So like I told you earlier, first thing a doctor would do is rule out a swollen joint secondary to infection. If I'm able to take out some crystals, fluid and look under the microscope, I've made their diagnosis. But if I'm unable to do it, and of course nobody wants to do an injection if they don't want to, um, you can always do a big site ultrasound, which can help make a diagnosis also. See, thank you so much for the question. Um, now let us look at a Facebook comment. Um, so uh, this first question, um, can gout affect the heart? Okay, very interesting question. Like I said earlier, gout does not affect your heart. It's mainly over your joints and limbs. However, a gout patient has been shown to have a higher risk of cardiovascular diseases. So, of course, when you see a gout patient, you just don't treat the gout. You have to make sure you screen for other cardiovascular diseases such as diabetes, hypertension, and high cholesterol. So, indirectly, you can say it has a higher risk of heart issues. And then, okay, moving on to the second Facebook comment. <clears throat> How can gout affect the kidneys? Okay, basically, we all know gout forms tophi. So these same tophi can actually happen in your kidney, and we call that kidney stones. But it can also deficit around the cortex of the kidney, causing nephrolithiasis. So all these are reasons why a patient should be started on uric lowering therapy. So eventually, it can cause kidney uh, failure by causing kidney diseases. Okay, moving on to the next question from the Google form. Um, someone actually asked, uh, are there any chances to really cure gut? And especially, well, because I'm also a dietitian, so whenever <laughs> I see a patient, they yes. sometimes will also ask me, like, um, is there any possible chance to really get rid of this? Will it never happen again? So what uh, do you think of that? Okay. If you speak to us in the rheumatology community, we'll tell you gout is curable. Mm -hmm. But of course, it's curable with a combination of medication and lifestyle modification. Um, can you cure gout and prevent it from coming back ever again? I would say yes. I'll be able to reduce the number of attacks. I'll be able to reduce how often you get it, reduce <coughs> the progression of your joint damage, yes. But, of course, the patient has to be disciplined. Mm -hmm. you know, diet, diet plays a big part in yeah. curing gout. Thank you so much. <clears throat> and then, um, maybe you go for the next question. Mm -hmm. So, uh, just now, Dr. Shamala talked a lot about food. And food might be one of the most important roles in maintaining and preventing the further attacks of gout. And um, any even more specific food that Dr. Shamala would like to share what kind of patient did they ever told you they, what are kind of specific food they eat and what you <coughs> advice on that? So, <clears throat> like I told you earlier, the, the, the list is very exhausted. Yeah. But if you actually speak to a gout patient, one patient will tell you <coughs> it's related to red meat. Another patient will tell you it's the seafood. But another patient will tell you it's the kacang, you know, simple peanuts. So I always tell my patients, it's very important you keep a diary. What mm -hmm. is your trigger? So maybe my trigger is not the same as your trigger. And it sometimes depends on your metabolic of your body, basically. Things that we don't understand until today. So I always say, keep a diary, see what is your most trigger, and avoid it, obviously. I see. 
understood. I actually totally agree with what Dr. Sharma has said. So as a dietitian, what, uh, what we often see patient is also incorporate all of these really high purine food. And not only that, but actually some of the patients, they might actually taking very diet high in fat, eventually causing their weight <coughs> status to spike up. So what we actually also work hand in hand to mm -hmm. help patient mm -hmm. maybe can opt for a weight loss, or oh, go course, for a, yes. Exercise and drink more fluid and Correct. keep up with hydration. Yes. Like I told you earlier, uh, Georgian, actually, the studies have shown that one third of patients, when they're having an acute attack, have a very low urea as a level. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it actually depends on how high your urea as a level has been for a long mm -hmm. time, and one day it just precipitates into your joints and then it comes in with an attack. But during that stage, doing a uric acid level is not going to help you make a diagnosis. So very important, you hydrate yourself, you exercise, you reduce the risk factors for having uh, cardiovascular issues. Thank you so much, Dr. Sharma. So at the end of the day, um, do you have any specific message to tell our audience here? What they can learn, what you would want them to know about? Yes, um, I think the take home message from my presentation will be Please note that gout is treatable, it's controllable, and uh, I think it's curable. Um, but very important, it comes with a lot of lifestyle modifications and discipline. And of course, please come and see your rheumatologist to get further advice. Thank you. Yep, actually, I agree with that. Thank you so much, Dr. Shama, for having sharing this such an informative talk with us today. And most importantly, uh, thank you so much, all of you, for attending this talk today as well. So um, I hope all of us get to learn something very fruitful and very beneficial. And let us see, us, uh, see you next time in our next Facebook Live talk. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Bye. <laughs>